all of them, you know, had an extraordinary gift, especially Paul. Paul was the musician's musician of the group. His gift for melody in particular, boy, I mean, at least once in a generation, almost once in a century, you know, his ability to write these beautiful, beautiful, singable, but also somehow challenging and counterintuitive melodies that just sound like they've always existed and he pulled them out of thin air. That's a big part of their genius for sure. Junctures from Liverpool, England. Hello, I'm Jack, and you're listening to the Here, There, and Everywhere podcast, an interview show about the Beatles' influence in the past, present, and future across the universe and across generations. Welcome back to Here, There, and Everywhere. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Josh Turner on the show. Josh is a multi instrumentalist, singer, songwriter, and producer. If you've ever been on YouTube, you have definitely seen one of his videos. Josh has over half a million subscribers, while his videos each have earned millions of views since he started the channel in 2007 at age 15. Josh is now touring internationally with Carson McKee as the folk duo The Other Favorites. Josh has actually covered a bunch of Beatles songs, such as And Your Bird Can Sing, Here, There, and Everywhere, Don't Let Me Down, Eleanor Rigby, She's Leaving Home. You can find them all on YouTube. So let's hop into the interview. Hey Josh, how's it going? So you have half a million subscribers on YouTube, your videos have millions of views, and now you're selling out shows while on tour. Can you walk me through how you got started with all of this? Yeah, I came to music in a, well, what I think is an unusual way. My parents were not musicians, and my my mom's my mom's parents were musicians, but you know I didn't grow up in a in an especially musical household. Both of my parents enjoyed music, and they and they put me in music lessons. But I I never really considered it as a career until I was well into college, actually, and I had wanted to go into uh, car design for a long time, and then realized sort of at the last minute that that wasn't for me. There was sort of too much math involved, and and so as I started taking more and more music classes during college, I realized that 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 was the thing for me. Prior to that time, I started a YouTube channel in 2007 just because I enjoyed the music of Leo Kotke and I wanted to post my covers of Leo Kotke's songs <laughs> out there for, for people to see. It was a very small online community of Leo Kotke fans up there at the time. And I had a sister who was in college who made me aware of YouTube really early on because I don't think I would have come across it in 2007 otherwise. But but yeah, I mean, it it started out as a simple means of socializing with friends and getting, you know, getting together to record a song was like a reason to hang out basically. And, and over time it got, the channel started to gain some more views. A couple of my videos got posted to Reddit and went a little bit viral as a result of that. And, and it really snowballed from there. And so when I graduated from college, having recently decided that I wanted to try and make music a career, my YouTube channel was sort of the best thing I had going. And so I was, you know, it was, this was in, I graduated in 2015, and that was sort of right towards the beginning of the time where it was feasible to try doing YouTube basically as a full-time job. And so, so yeah, I started getting more deliberate about my videos. I started a Patreon page. I moved to New York a year after I graduated college, and, and I'm pretty much still at it. I started, I quit doing part-time jobs in 2018 when I got the offer to do some touring, and I'm still doing those things. When did you first become interested in classic music, such as Paul Simon and the Beatles? Well, my my dad introduced me to a lot of that stuff when I was very young. He 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 he's sort of like a bedroom, you know, guitar strummer. And and when I was a kid, he would he would play me folk songs to sort of fall asleep to and things like that. So he would play, you know, your Here Comes the Suns and your Fifty Ninth Street Bridge songs and things like that. And so I had had that stuff bouncing around in my head from a very very young age. And I remember distinctly i was probably i don't know seven or something like that six or seven when he checked out a cd of abbey road from the library which really makes me feel ancient the <laughs> sentence checked out a cd from the library and brought it home and we i listened to that on like our boom box and that was the first time in my life that i really that music really grabbed me in any kind of way that music wasn't just something that was happening in the background that I it like had my full attention and I listened to the album the whole way through. Um, so so yeah, the, my the, I came to the Beatles particularly early and um, 
And then when I started playing guitar, the I, I started teaching myself the very, very first week. The very first thing I ever did was uh, my dad had the Beatles complete easy chord book. And so um, I flipped through and found the song with the least chords, which was all together now. <laughs> right. And, and that was the first song I ever played on guitar. So, yeah. So what was it about the Beatles music that captivated you when you first heard that CD? And what made their music different from the other music you were hearing at that time? Well, it's not, I mean, it's hard for me to, to cast my mind back accurately to, you know, when I was seven or whatever. But I think that album in particular, which, I don't know, I always go back and forth on what the best Beatles album is, but there have certainly been plenty of times in which I would argue that that was the best Beatles album. You know, I wasn't really listening to lyrics yet at that point in my life. I wasn't really processing, you know, I didn't have the the understanding of the world or the emotional maturity to be able to kind of process most song lyrics at that time, unless it was like Raffi or something like that. But, but even devoid of lyrics, there's just a sort of compositional element to that album. You know, it's, it's almost like a, it's almost like a classical, it's like, it's like a, it's like a symphony almost, you know, it's like how, like there are themes that come and go and, and how there's just so many sounds that are incorporated at different times. And, there are some things that are like short, concise ideas and some things that are long ideas. And I don't know, for, for some reason, it just it was the perfect blend of ingredients to to completely capture whatever it is that I was just beginning to respond to as a as a listener of music. And it remains that, you know, to this day. I mean, I, I think it's perfect. It's, it's completely airtight, you know, from from a, especially from a musical standpoint. There's just no stir, no stone that was unturned mm -hmm. on Abbey Road. And that was that was my endpoint to to the Beatles. I sort of did the reverse chronology from there. Have you ever felt ostracized or out of place amongst your peers, specifically because of your interest in older music? The only time that I've ever really felt that way was as a young kid. I think it was unusual as an elementary school student, you know, to be listening primarily to the Beatles and and you know, musicians of a similar time period, you know, and a little bit, there's a little bit of like middle school teasing that goes on about that type of thing, you know, that I wasn't listening to, you know, the Black Eyed Peas, you know, but was listening to like the one CD that had just come out or whatever. And yeah, I don't know. I it not, but not really though, like, because I had two older sisters who ha were fed a similar musical diet growing up to me. So they were, you know, aware of all the Beatles stuff. And then when I was 14, I met my f now longtime friend and musical collaborator, Carson McKee, who I play in as a duo called The Other Favorites. And he he was a similar sort of oddball to me, you know. And so because we met in a public middle school where I think it was, you know, the, the degree of sort of like enforcement of social conformity is very high in eighth grade, you know. And so to find another person who was not really concerned about that, you know, and, and was just like, well, I like old music and that's just the way it is, was that was a, that was a I guess you could say a vindicating moment. And so from the time I was 14 onward, you know, if nobody else, I at least had one other person my age who I could always talk to about the Beatles, about, you know, Dylan, who he's been obsessed with for a long time. And so on. And so, so yeah, I mean, it's, it hasn't been a huge factor for me, but I also, I just never really cared, you know, cause I just, it, it was, it was satisfying enough just to listen to it. When you met Carson, was that a moment where you felt like you met your John Lennon or your Paul McCartney when it comes to songwriting partnerships? And when you and Carson write songs today, do you two go about it in the same way John and Paul used to write songs together? I think that I I certainly wouldn't have thought of it that way at the time. You know, I don't think I would have drawn any so any so grand a comparison. You know, as a as a fourteen year old, as to I, that that would have been giving myself far too much credit to be like, haha, I am I am Paul McCartney and I have found my John Lennon. <laughs> but you know, I, I do think that part of the reason that we've been able to work together for such a long time is because we balance each other out pretty well in terms of our creative approach in our relationship to music in, you know, in a way which I think there are some similarities to, to a John and Paul type situation. I, you know, we met in middle school, we had both, we were both totally self-taught at that time. And we would eventually then go on to college where Carson would study English and I would study music. And so 
the mold that we took on for a long time was that Carson wrote most of the lyrics and that I did all the arranging and, and wrote a lot of the chord structures and things like that. And so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, for a long time, I think it was actually closer to more like a, um, like a George and Ira Gershwin situation, you know, like almost like a Tin Pan Alley type thing than a, than a John and Paul type thing, because, you know, it, I, for a very long time, I was never bringing complete songs to the table. Uh, it was usually that Carson had a great lyrical idea with maybe some sort of rudimentary chords under it that I would then flesh out and turn into, you know, a full, fully realized song. But increasingly, I think it does look a little more like that, where I, I've been bringing more lyrics to the table. I've become at least marginally more comfortable with my own lyric writing ability in the last couple of years. So so our songwriting doesn't adhere to any particular mold. For a long time, he was lyrics, I was music, but these days it's it's much more fluid. Have the Beatles influenced your life in any way aside from music taste? I mean, I think aesthetically, just sort of capital A, broadly speaking, I, I just love how many identities the Beatles went through when they were you know, sort of in their 64 to 70 heyday. And I, I've always just found that really freeing, you know, that they were under a lot of like label pressure and, you know, and, and they were producing records at an unbelievable speed, but they were just trying new stuff constantly. Um, and that drive to try new things and the way that they were, you know, sort of rewarded for their efforts of trying new things. Because, you know, this, there was in the 60s, I think, as much as there is now, a lot of pressure when um, a pop artist hits on a successful formula to keep doing that thing. Um, and back in the day, it might have been a label executive saying, hey, write another hit that sounds like, you know, the one that you just sold a million copies of. And now it's the, you know, it's it's algorithms that are driving that where it's just like, hey, you made a video of, you know, yourself doing a guitar cover of like a classic rock song. So now do another one of those because that's what's going to get traction. But the Beatles were like, screw that, you know, like we're going to do a record that has backwards guitar on it and then a record that has, you know, Indian music on it and then a record that, you know, is that has a completely white album cover with no name, you know, <laughs> like so it's just like it, just like the, how how uh, unafraid they were to just be bold, you know, and and try new stuff is uh, something that I really very much try and live by with my own artistic output. Josh, what's your favorite era of the Beatles? Is it the Mop Top Beatles? Is it the Sgt. Pepper phase? Is it the long hair hippie white album phase? I I think I think like 66, 66 Beatles probably has to be my favorite. The the sort of re revolver through like Penny Lane single era to me, the like the the Penny Lane Strawberry Fields B side, like that that to me is just the perfect i mean that that to me was like the apex of their of their musical journey you know mm -hmm. where they where they it was the perfect perfect blend of like of super short to the point songwriting with great vocal harmonies a great pop sensibility but there was there but also they were starting to you know get quite experimental as well in their in their engineering choices and production choices and things like that that's the most that's the most quintessentially beatlesy stuff to me and, and i don't know it's the stuff that i that, that when I listen to it, you know, even for the hundredth, thousandth time, it's just, right. man, like, how do they come up with it? <laughs> you know? So, yeah, that I, th I think, I think like 66, like uh, Revolver, Revolver and immediately post Revolver, you know, getting into Magical Mystery era is, that's my favorite. As a musician, can you tell us what separates the Beatles on a compositional level from other bands and acts? Like, what makes a Beatles song so identifiable? And when you hear it, you just immediately know it's the Beatles. Well, you know, this is this is a question that the answer to which, like, I think I would I would give you a different answer over time. And like, or I guess I should say when I first discovered the Beatles, I would have given you a different answer than I than I will now, because I think that their musical genius as individuals is an important part of it, but it's it's far from all of it. You know, I think that all of them, you know, had an extraordinary gift, especially Paul. I mean, Paul, Paul is the musician's musician of the group. I think nobody would argue with that. And his ability, his, his gift for melody in particular, boy, I mean, it, it, at least once in a generation, almost once in a century, you know, his ability to write these beautiful, beautiful 
singable, but also somehow challenging and counterintuitive melodies that just sound like they've always existed. And he pulled them out of thin air. That's a big part of their genius for sure. You know, I don't, I don't think that most of their brilliance, at least for me, lay in their lyric writing ability as much. Um, but that wasn't really, that wasn't really their scene though. You know, they weren't, they weren't trying to be Bob Dylan. Um, and so, yeah, so, I mean, the, the sheer mu musical brilliance of them as individuals, especially Paul is the first ingredient. The second ingredient is George Martin because George Martin, I was listening to, there's a really great podcast called that sixties recording podcast. If you're, if you're familiar with that, you know, I actually um, haven't heard that one. Oh, I, I can't recommend it highly enough. It, it also, they love discussing the Beatles, but it's much more from a technical sort of engineering perspective. And they were talking about how George Martin was a producer of comedy records for a fair while for the BBC before signing the Beatles and how, uh, you know, you couldn't make the same joke twice on a record and how there were a lot of sort of sonic gags and things like that. And he was coming up with innovative ways to make sounds for comedy records and how that sort of experimental sensibility and and sort of whimsical lightheartedness made its way into the music production work that he that he moved on to do. But I mean, you know, he wrote all the string orchestrations. He played a lot of the difficult piano parts, you know, which are huge parts of what makes the songs what they are. Right. And he was usually the one behind the glass saying like, all right, boys, like <laughs> just take 27. But I think I think the next one's really going to be excellent. <laughs> like th that he was the one who who could sift through 30 takes of a song and say, OK, this one, that's the one that has the right feeling. You know, the value of that is not to be understated. And especially watching Let It Be or Get Back, which we can talk about more you know, later. It's it's especially apparent how much there was for him to sift through, you know, how long it would take them to arrive at a complete version of a song. And so, yeah, George Martin's the second ingredient. And then the third ingredient is the engineering, you know, especially Jeff Emmerich and, you know, to to a lesser extent, Malcolm Toft, Glenn Johns, the other people who became involved later on, who, you know, th you know, John would be on acid and say, like, I want it to sound like, you know, it's whatever insane thing that I'm picturing right now. And they would just figure out a way to do it. <laughs> it had never been done before. Right. Isn't that nuts? Yeah. It's just so insane. Like, you know, when you hear about like the, the stuff they came up with, uh, all the studio innovations they came up with, with like double tracking and things like that, like the ADT machine and all of the modified all tech gear that they were using, you know, that was basically unique to the EMI studios, that the actual way that things sound is just astonishing. And the remixes that have been coming out recently heighten that you know, heighten my appreciation of that aspect even further, because now that we have really excellent converters that we can, you know, make new, make new copies of the master off of, and we have more advanced mixing technology, you can, you can, it really, the engineering just really, really continues to shine through. There's, there's almost nothing else from the late sixties with, with a very few exceptions. There's almost nothing else that sounds even close to as good in the pop sphere. You know, the Beach Boys, the the Stones, like their records all, they're, they're vibey and they have cool character, but they sound like they're covered in wool compared to the Beatles stuff from that period of time. And that's just so amazing to me, just the, the, the actual way that it sounds. So, yeah, those those three things. Do you think that George Martin was the fifth Beatle? Yes, unequivocally, unequivocally, George Martin was the fifth Beatle, period. What do you think it is about the Beatles that makes them so much more than just you know, just a band that was around for a couple of years in the 60s? Well, I mean, I do think that, I do think that the Beatles were very much in the right place at the right time. You know, I, I, like, I think we have to give credit to that fact that they were brilliant, you know, and they did meet up with a great team of people and, and whatever, but like also you had, you know, it could have only happened when like England was in like this huge like post-war economic boom and like, you know, and there was like a huge appetite for, you know, new culture, especially sort of like teen culture and like all this stuff. And and record companies were willing to take more risks than they had been previously and like try, you know, new types of things for that reason. I mean, for for those practical reasons, they were they were unique. You know, I think it's. I think it's because of the ripple effect that so much of their music just had on had on the industry you know the, the the fact that sounds and ideas that the Beatles pioneered can still be heard in a lot of pop music and have, have been heard in various eras of pop music in the in the intervening decades basically you know I mean like when I remember when Toxic by Britney Spears came out and the first thing that I thought was like wow this sounds like a Beatles song you know oh because, interesting you know, yeah well because it's got it's a it's a high budget pop song 
with sort of like bubblegummy lyrics, but then it's written with this sort of like North Indian, like string orchestra orchestration. It's written in an unusual mode, which like, you know, m- modes in pop music, pretty rare still, you know, for the most part. Or like, gosh, I mean, you know, you listen to Helter Skelter and it's like nothing, nothing rocked that hard for almost a decade <laughs> after that, you know, it's <laughs> oh, just that's like, true, yeah. it's, so it, like it took a long time for people to figure out like how to make music that sounded that raw and, and people, I think just keep being able to reference back to the, to the Beatles. I mean, like in the nineties, there was a huge resurgence of interest in that, like bands like Cake and Beck and people like that, you know, where there's like these like horn lines in their stuff, which are, which are very George Martin esque. And yeah. And, and now we have a new generation of people who are being influenced by what Beck was doing in the nineties. And, and so it's sort of like, they're like the grandchildren of the influence of the Beatles. You know what I mean? Like what people are doing now with Ableton was what the tape ops were doing, you know, at, at Abbey Road and at EMI back in the day where they're like chopping stuff up and, and manipulating sounds in new and creative ways. And the Beatles were the first ones to really, really push the envelope on, on sound manipulation. You know, and now we talk about, I always kind of chuckle when I hear like usually baby boomers rail against like sampling and sample based music because you know, I'm just like, well, but what about like Tomorrow Never Knows? Like Tomorrow Never Knows was just a tape loop, you know, with with some verses over yeah. it. And like, what is a tape loop if not a sample? And so, so yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's all sort of, it all just, it's, there's just an almost bottomless well of creativity for people to draw from there. And even if they don't realize that they're, even, even if they're not drawing on the Beatles directly, they're almost certainly in some case drawing on somebody who did draw on the Beatles directly. So, so that's why I think it continues to have such a ripple effect. Josh, earlier you mentioned the Get Back documentary. I would love to hear your thoughts about it. So I have to admit, I've actually only seen the first two segments of it so far. It's, it's, it's you know, so, a lot of people I talk to have only seen the first two segments. That's really interesting. It's so long. Uh, it <laughs> is. <laughs> even, a, even as a devout Beatles fan, like, I, and I want to give it like my full attention, you know, like I want to sit down in front of a TV with like good speakers, like lights off, like bold popcorn, like let's go, you know? Right. And so it can be difficult to make the time to watch, you know, a Lord of the Rings trilogy length, you know, experience of yeah. that. But so, yeah, I watched the first two. And my impressions were, I mean, overall, I obviously loved it. I'm so glad that it exists. It's, it's a, an incredible historical record. And, you know, the thing that caught me immediately and perhaps most strongly is just, the, is just the quality of the audio and video is extraordinary. The fact that you could get grainy 16 millimeter film, you know, into that was shot in four by three now into 16 by nine glorious 4k and the sound is even more amazing because apparently they developed some sort of like machine learning AI to be able to pick out the Beatles' individual voices and then remix it off of a piece of mono tape, which was recorded, you know, through like one AKG dynamic mic that was just over their heads through like a Nagro recorder, you know, that like whatever. All, you know, it's it's amazing. It's a, it's it's a, it's a tech it's a huge technical feat, I think, first and foremost. I wish it had been filmed during one of the albums of theirs that I enjoy more. Right. <laughs> you know, I I think that they put. I think that they put such enormous constraints on themselves, such enormous limitations to do Let It Be, which I didn't really realize until I was watching it. So, I, I mean, I, it's it's interesting in that regard to see it's like, oh, well, this is why the record sounds the way it does is because they put themselves under a crazy amount of pressure to write and record something in a super short period of time and then have it culminate with their first live performance in ages and ages, all with no clear leadership, right? Because... Uh, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. Oh, Brian Epstein. Right, because right, because Brian Epstein had just passed away. So under those circumstances, the record actually makes a lot of sense, but it's still not my favorite. It's still not as cohesive. I think the writing's not as strong, and it's not as sonically creative as most of their other albums. But but even you know, d- despite that, it's fascinating. It's fascinating to watch Paul just come up with hits, you know, on the spot. And it's it's fascinating to see their dynamics, you know, play out. And it's fascinating to to see the narrative pretty conclusively rewritten about, you know, how toxic their relationships were or weren't at that period of time, like what Yoko's involvement was with everything. And yeah, it's fascinating. I I think they could have tightened it up a little bit personally, but I also understand that they kind of had one shot to make it and get it right. And I would rather of them have included maybe more than was necessary than less, you know? So that's how Mm. I feel about it. Which album do you wish that documentary took place during? 
Sergeant Pepper. Definitely Sergeant Pepper. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Not my it's not my favorite album, but I think it's probably I would say that it's their most important album from like a cultural legacy perspective just because it it pushed the boundary so so much and is the most sonically adventurous. Do you have a favorite Beatles album? It always changes. Which is it right now? Probably Abbey Road. Probably Abbey Road. But it was the White Album for a long time, especially with the 2018 remix, which I think is outstanding. Um, and uh, and then it's Revolver sometimes as well. You know, a moment during the Abbey Road recordings, which I would have loved to see in a documentary film, is when John, Paul, and George were recording the three guitar solos for the song The End. Uh, that would have been oh, incredible. Oh, man, yeah. That would, have been, that would have been great. Can't believe they missed that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and one of the only stereo drum recordings of Ringo ever made. Really? Oh, I yeah. didn't know that. Mm-hmm. That drum solo blows me away every single time. So, Josh, what are you up to now? What kind of projects have you been involved with recently? So, my my wife Kelly and I are a creative team at this point. She does all the video for my YouTube channel, and she handles a lot of the sort of admin side of things. But we also just sort of cook up projects together. And so, what we're working on right now is a an album and video series for the channel that we uh, recorded last August and September. We took a road trip around the whole country all the way to LA and back. And we filmed uh, a dozen YouTube videos with uh, collaborators in different cities along the way in different genres and different configurations. There's a classical guitar duet. There's some sort of like aughts, like early aughts indie rock covers. There's some, there's a jazz standard. There's an old country tune, you know, a little bit of everything and ensembles ranging from, you know, just me and one other person up to me with this one with me and a 16 part choir and a three piece rhythm section. So it, it really sort of runs the gamut. And it is also like sort of a travelogue documentary type thing. And that's going to be the first time we're trying that on the YouTube channel. So that has been a process we've been working on for many months now with me doing the audio mixing and Kelly doing the video editing. And now we're to the point where we're figuring out promotion and and how how we want to go about release strategy and things like that because it is really just the two of us and so so yeah so we'll we'll be posting a trailer for that within the coming weeks and then it's going to start rolling out towards the end of March and where can people find your music your videos your projects and your tour information you can find my well almost anything on my YouTube page Josh Turner guitar that's sort of my my hub of everything and then you can also find all info and tour dates on joshturnerguitar.com. My right now I'm on tour with Carson McKee. We play as the other favorites and we are the other favorites.com and you can find all of our tour dates there and places to listen to music, stream music and watch YouTube videos, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's all online, you know. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Josh, I have one more question for you and it is where do you see the Beatles music in 5 to 10 years but also 50 to 100 years into the future will they still be around will they still be talked about well in the short term i mean i think that the surviving beatles and their estates have been really savvy about continuing to find ways to monetize their catalog (laughs) you know i think every time that there's a remix right you know it's like every time there's a new album remix and we reintroduce that into the public conscience and and now there's the the get back which is a a big sort of moment of Beatles zeitgeist. And, and I think they'll be able to keep, you know, nursing that for a little while. But eventually, you know, I think that the Beatles are probably going to just be canonized uh, in the way that in the way that a lot of classical music is canonized and, and jazz music is now taught in schools. And I, I think that, you know, as funny as it would have probably seemed to, if you were to tell somebody this in the, 19, in the 1960s, I think it's going to become just part of the story of Western music. And I think it's it's going to be part of musical academia that you would be taught along with when you learn about, you know, Beethoven and Mozart and George Gershwin and, and you know, whoever else. I think that pop music is, well, I think they will have, they, they have done a lot and will continue to do a lot to legitimize pop music as an art form and something that's worthy of study. And so I think that, yeah, I think their legacy probably more so than any of their contemporaries will continue to live on in that context. Do you think we're going to get remixes of their early albums like Please Please Me and With the Beatles? Oh, God, I would love that. Um, it's tough. I, I think that I've I heard that the reason that they haven't done it yet is because since it was all done on four track, um, they can't 
there, there, there's just so many fewer options in terms of what they can do with the remixing. But, but then again, Sgt. Pepper was on four track. So if they could do it with that, you know, exactly. I don't know. No excuses. Come on, Giles Martin, get your, get Come your act on, together. Giles. Man. The appetite is there. <laughs> <laughs> I would love it. I would. I would really love that. I, I, we got to get those. We got to get those tambourines out of the hard pan. You know, that's, right. that's the worst. <laughs> Josh, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate you taking the time. It was great talking to you. Thank you for having me, Jack. I'll talk about the Beatles any day of the week. <laughs> <laughs>